On the back of this recent video, I got a lot of mainly US viewers and some younger UK viewers who couldn't quite believe that radio scanning in the UK was and is still illegal. Well, in this video I've dug through some old radio scanning tools and archived message boards from way back in the day to give you a picture of what just the police side of radio scanning was like in order to answer those questions. During the 1990s, a few dedicated monitors gripped by an obsessive and seriously hardcore radio scanning craze were unravelling a complex network of police and government communications up and down the UK. Most of their work was centred around London's Metropolitan Police, and right up until the digital switchover to the private and encrypted Tetra airwave system, the most sensitive radio communications imaginable were being eavesdropped on. Radio scanner books and newsletters were packed to the brim with all manner of frequencies and easily accessible message boards enabled an almost daily flurry of new information that anybody could digest. Over 25 years ago, details of analogue radio systems used by royal protection teams, royal residences and even the royal train were controversially released. Call signs and frequencies for tactical firearms units and armed response vehicles were printed in books you could buy off the shelf. You could access information on how and where to listen to the Thames River Police and the Metropolitan Police Air Support Units. There were listings for the Ministry of Defence Police, Bank of England bullion movements and even the Crown Jewel movements. Suddenly, listening to your local bobby or traffic unit wasn't enough, and the VHF and UHF police allocations were blown wide open for anyone to hear. Enthusiast has managed to breach security by listening in on conversations between police and security service agents, and then placing the details on the internet. Fergus is here. Fergus, how did he do it? Well, Fiona, you might think tapping into our security services would be impossible. In fact, it's worryingly easy. So how does he do it? Well, using this, a handheld radio scanner bought for about £200. He tunes in to confidential conversations and then he posts the radio frequencies on internet sites. He monitored police transmissions on the movements of the Queen when she visited Stornoway on her Jubilee tour. But can stray police radio messages really pose a threat to security? They can if you have enough information to piece together the whole picture. Scanners monitored Bill Clinton's every move on a visit to Britain. It's not illegal to own a scanner, but it is to listen in on conversations. On today's evidence, that's just not secure enough. This all sounds a bit overdramatic, doesn't it? But the British government quickly became aware of this situation and migrated to a secure voice and data communication system known as Airwave beginning in 2006. First though, we need to go back in time over a hundred years and look at an extremely brief top-line history of police radio allocations in the UK. So, in 1922, the Metropolitan Police came on the air on 410 kHz and 1331 kHz. 1927 saw Lancashire Police on the air between 1500 and 2000 kHz. A number of other forces came on between 2030 and 2070 kHz in 1929 as part of a Home Office radio plan, and numerous other forces were added into this scheme between 1935 and 1938. Things all changed in 1944 when the police in England and Scotland arrived on what we now know as the FM Band 2 broadcast band and above as high as 244 MHz. By 1950, English and Welsh police forces and fire services were all allocated between 83.2 and 99.9 MHz. Then, after the World Administrative Radio Conference of 1979, the police were again moved to high-band VHF between 147.875 and 154.6125 MHz. Between 1987 and 1989, there was a major overhaul in the UK's Emergency Service Radio Communication Scheme. There was a mass migration during this time of police radio systems from low-band VHF to high-band VHF and UHF. For this new allocation, I'm going to just focus on the Metropolitan Police and may make further updates on other forces if there's any interest. The new Metropolitan Police VHF radio system was divided into five main areas or divisions Central, Northwest, Northeast, Southeast, and Southwest. Each area was assigned to what was known as a VHF main set frequency or channel, 
there were 15 main set channels in total. First we'll look at the first four area channels. These were known as area crime channels and were the main frequencies for the assignment of incidents to response cars and other mobile units. The north and south refers to north or south of the River Thames. Area 1, or central, was assigned to Channel 1 and served Belgravia, Notting Hill, Brompton, West End Central, Charing Cross, Marylebone, Paddington, Fulham and Hammersmith. Area 2, or northwest, was assigned to Channel 2 and served Hampstead, Kentish Town, Hoburn, Holloway, Islington, Kilburn, Harrow, Wembley, Barnet and Hartsmere, Golders Green, West Hendon, Ealing, Southall, Hornsey and Tottenham. Area 3 or North East was assigned to Channel 1 and served Shoreditch and Hackney, Stoke Newington, Limehouse, Whitechapel, Barkingside, Chingford, Redbridge, Ilford, Havering, Forest Gate, Dagenham, Plaistow, Edmonton, Enfield and Ponders Green. Area 4 or South East was assigned to Channel 3 and served Southwark, Peckham, Walworth, Catford, Lewisham, Bromley, Plumstead, Greenwich, Bexley Heath, Croydon, South Norwood and Epsom. And Area 5 or South West was assigned to Channel 4 and served the Thames, Brixton, Streatham, Vauxhall, Chiswick, Hounslow, Spelthorne, Twickenham, Kingston, Wimbledon, Battersea, Wandsworth and Hillingdon. So each of the five areas used one of four main set channels. Why they didn't use five I don't know. Channel 5 was known as the citywide secondary channel. Channel 6 was largely unused, used for special circumstances or as a backup for another channel. This system was seriously sophisticated and if other channels were required, they could be switched into the network. This was mainly used for special events, public order situations or other kinds of disturbances. Channel 7 was known as the firearms or robbery squad channel. Channel 8 was used for diplomatic or royalty protection. Channel 9 was used for traffic tunnels and on-site events. Channel 10 was area traffic control. Channel 11 was used as a spare. Channel 12 was a citywide main traffic channel. Channel 13 was used as a spare. And channels 14 and 15 were used as spares. Just going back a minute to channel 8, this was mainly used by diplomatic and close protection. This could be anything from a diplomat or politician to the crown jewels or a category A prisoner. Even more interesting was what became known in the scanning community as the Purple Channel. This was an AM radio system that was used by Special Branch. It was alleged that before it disappeared 25 years ago, it formed part of a phone patch system that went through to the royal residences. Each member of the royal family had their own purple call sign consisting of the word purple and one or two digits. These have been reported in various news publications over the years. Visiting foreign dignitaries or high up British dignitaries had the call sign prefix METPOL followed by three numbers. For example, METPOL 701 was used for the Prime Minister. The other much larger part of the Met Police's system was the METPOL UHF allocation. This was a trunked Motorola Type 2 system that was rolled out in 1996. It utilised 14 sites and could be monitored using a normal scanner, although trunk scanners worked better and people wrote software to enable the tracking of communications on this system. Also known as Motorola Smart Zone, whenever an officer pressed a PTT on their radio, the radio changed frequency, and was able to use a pool of 10 or so frequencies for each area or cell. Metpol UHF was divided into 14 cells, with the first frequency in each cell being the primary control channel, the second and third were usually alternate control channels. Some frequencies were shared between two cells at opposite ends of the metropolitan area. Under normal circumstances, a radio in one cell wouldn't be able to hear the other cell it shared a frequency with. There was cell 1, East London Inner, which covered Shoreditch, Stoke Newington, Limehouse, Whitechapel, Leighton, Barkingside, Chingford, Forest Gate and Plaistow. Cell 2 was South East London Inner, which covered Walworth, South Norwood, Plumstead, Bromley, Catford, Peckham, Bexley Heath, Greenwich, Southwark and Lewisham. Cell 3 was South West London Inner, which covered Streatham, Battersea, Kingston, Vauxhall, Wandsworth, Chiswick, Wimbledon, Hounslow, Peckham, Twickenham and Brixton. Cell 4 was Central London, which covered Belgravia, Brompton, Paddington, West End Central, Hammersmith, Marylebone, 
Fulham, Charing Cross and Notting Hill. Cell 5 was North West London Inner, which covered Barnet, Kentish Town, Tottenham, Hornsey, Hampstead, Ealing, Wembley, Hoburn, Islington, Southall, Holloway and Kilburn. Cell 6 was North East London Outer, which covered Edmonton and Enfield. Cell 7 was East London Middle, which covered Dagenham, Ilford, Barkingside and Walthamstow. Cell 8 was East London Outer, which covered Havering. Cell 9 was South East London Outer, which covered Bromley, Lewisham, Bexley Heath and Greenwich. Cell 10 was South London Outer, which covered Croydon, Epsom and South Norwood. Cell 11 was South West London Outer, which covered Kingston. Cell 12 was West London Outer, which covered Harrow, Hillingdon, Southall, Spelthorne, Twickenham, Chiswick, Hounslow and Heathrow. Cell 13 was North West London Outer, which covered West Hendon and Harrow. And finally, cell 14 was the VHF helicopter gateway. Of course, it didn't take long for listeners to start tracking the VHF mainset activity as well as the trunked action on the UHF allocation to build up a picture of the Met Police's day-to-day activities across the city. Like any other police force, there were channels used for the regional crime squad, the flying squad, special branch, the terrorist branch, forensics, photographic units, surveillance teams, prisons and everything in between. Speaking of prisons, between about 6am and 8am, London's prisons would call upon the main set VHF Channel 8 for a radio check. Naturally, all of this information ended up being published in scanner frequency guides, so it could be monitored out in the open for the most part. Anyone in and miles around London could receive MI5's top secret watcher radio network, the system used to control surveillance teams watching diplomats and spy suspects all over London. The watcher signal, firstly on 87.7 and 104.5 MHz in the 1980s, came from Euston Tower, where the heavily curtained headquarters of MI5's watcher service were allegedly located, 15 floors above Capital Radio Studios. Unencrypted voice was heard here, as well as encrypted voice and data links. The watcher radio signals were moved to slightly higher frequencies by the 1990s, two of which ended up in scanning directories, but they were no better concealed from scanner enthusiasts. In these books you could find this interesting set of frequencies, although they were very much incognito. They went under the names Remington Minicabs and Lancer Minicabs. Remington Minicabs is believed to be named after Stella Remington, who just so happened to be the former Director General of MI5 from 1992 to 1996. Now, there's no way users of this frequency went around in the guise of Remington Minicabs. It's more likely that the publisher of the frequency directory didn't want to visit from the DTI, or even worse, spooks. Also during this time, Glassjar and Proton Control on the police frequencies of 147.5 and 147.85 were special branch surveillance control stations. The HM Customs and Excise main Magpie surveillance frequency was 86.71 MHz in the early days before moving up to high band VHF and UHF. During many early mornings, plainclothes agents with the Magpie call sign could be heard trailing drug suspects across London, and there can be little doubt that the drug smugglers were listening in as well. Of course, it wasn't all Met Police and UK government activity. Anyone with a radio scanner could hear Stagecoach talking to its eagles on 454.075, which was the US Embassy and its VIP car network. The embassy itself had many security and internal frequencies which were made available. It was also believed that the US Marines were part of the embassy's security outfit. At 8.30am daily, you'd hear Blackbird 01 being cleared onto the runway, code for the ambassador being cleared into the underground car park. Well, that's enough stories for one day, but I hope that gives you an educational look at what sort of stuff you could pick up on a radio scanner back in the 1990s, and why scanner monitoring was made illegal in the UK, and also why the Home Office decided to opt for a closed digital network.